You're listening to Podcateers. Welcome to episode 225 of Podcateers. This week we recap our trips to Mickey's Halloween party and discuss slash question the involvement of Disney's newest friendly neighborhood vampire, Vampirina. Make sure to check out the YouTube channel for the entire Cadaver Dance show from the Halloween party over at youtube.com slash podcateers. Make sure to like, subscribe, ring that bell icon for notifications whenever new videos are posted. And while you're there, head on over to youtube.com slash Disney for two and do the same for that channel. We also talk about Hong Kong Disneyland's Nightmare Before Christmas walkthrough. The Disneyland Resort has two new ambassadors, Fantasyland in someone's basement, and the tradition of the official Mickey Mouse portraits. More info on things that we talk about in this episode can be found over at podcateers.com slash 225. Make sure to hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. Join the conversation and give us your thoughts on anything that we talk about in this episode. If you're listening to this on launch day, on Friday, October 12th, 2018, we will be starting some auctions to help us raise money to help defeat cancer. We will be auctioning off a few items, including the new glowing cauldron popcorn bucket, a special Steamboat Willie popcorn bucket exclusive to movie theaters in Mexico, and some prints of some photos from around the parks. Each auction will be 24 hours, and you can check out our Instagram stories or the blog post for this episode for more information. Team Boat Willie will be walking in City of Hope's Walk for Hope on Sunday, November 4th, 2018. We would love it if you joined us as part of the team. You can join by heading over to TeamBoatWillie.com. It's super simple to remember because it's Steamboat Willie, but without the S. Uh, You'll find a link there to join the team. And if you can't make it or you're unable to be in California because you're in another state, you can contribute to our team goal by making a small donation, which you will also find a button for while on TeamBoatWillie.com. Every donation helps. If you can only give a dollar, that dollar actually goes a really long way to helping save someone's life. So again, more information can be found over at TeamBoatWillie.com. We really hope you guys can be out there for this amazing cause. Before we jump into the episode, huge thanks goes out to our podcast, Very Godparents, because it's their support that helped make these episodes of Podcateers possible through their generous contributions via Patreon. If you would like to become a fairy godparent of our podcast, or as they like to call themselves, the FGP Squad, you can do so for as little as $1 per month. But for a contribution of at least $5, you also get the exclusive fairy godparent button as a thank you for your support. More information about joining the FGP Squad can be found over at podcateers.com slash FGP. All right. It's time to jump into the episode. I don't know why I decided to even sing that. That's super weird, but I, I don't know why I did it. So anyway, here we go. It's time to jump into episode 225 of Podcateers. guys off with my with my sports like unjersey shirt thing that i'm wearing <laughs> yeah yeah and, and um, just the amount of knowledge <laughs> so for the listeners out there hazen's wearing a hockey t-shirt it's 2003 right. uh championship is that what it is it's when they won the western conference uh, the western conference anaheim ducks that's when they were still the Mighty Ducks. Oh, the Thank Mighty you. Ducks with the Disney touch, the Disney ownership. This was back in the Michael Eisner lost his mind days, and he's trying to buy <laughs> sports franchises and everything, man. Yeah. But the Mighty and- Ducks, was it was such a cool thing that they made a real team from a movie. It's insane. And that's right, really yeah. where my love came from. I mean, it yeah. didn't have anything to do with the Disney tie for me. I mean, it didn't hurt. Right. But Mm -hmm. for me, it was more about I I fell in love with the movies. And because of that, uh, I started playing. And then uh, when Anaheim ended up getting the team, I just thought, well, I mean, I need to be a fan. (laughs) I mean, how could I not be a fan? You know, I started playing hockey because of this. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've been kind of an on and off fan 
People get mad at me because they tell me you should be a Kings fan. You have to be a Kings fan. Yeah. And to those people, no. I say, quiet. <laughs> because those are the same people, and not all of them, but the majority of those people are the ones that are also, you can't be an Angels fan. You have to be a Dodger fan. Yeah. And look, man, you know me in the sports. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> I don't go, especially when it comes to baseball. I know you guys are hardcore baseball. I know, Melissa, you are Dodger blue in and out. But I, I am. <laughs> I mean, I go for the Dodger dogs and the nachos and the beer. And then yeah. when we go to Angel Stadium, we go for everything else. Like there's all the craft brewers around in the area and they have some great food at the stadium. I, I, I will say this. Watching it live is much more exciting than watching it on TV. Oh, oh God, yeah. hundred percent. Bottom line, when it comes to sports, just pick your just pick your team and just go for that team and be loyal. That's all I care about. I don't care if it's where you're from or not. Just pick your team and be loyal to that team, and that that's all that matters. That's yeah, what I'm and there could be rivalries, but you could still be friends with those who yeah. root for the other team. It's I mean, just freaking games, man. Yeah, it's for the love of it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I can be a fan of both the Dodgers and the Angels. They're two different leagues. Okay, <laughs> it's not like I said, I'm a Dodgers fan and I'm a Giants fan. Okay? Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. All right. I know better than that. But I mean, I could be a Dodgers fan and an Angels fan. They're two different leagues. I think I'm OK. Right. Yeah. Right. That's until it's the freeway series. And the Angels win. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> I know there's tons of Dodgers fans listening right now. They're all like, no, <laughs> what have you done? So how are you guys doing? Good, good. good. Yeah, just hanging in there. Yep. Kevin, how much candy did you collect? Um, very little, very little. Uh, as you know, I, I, I did not uh, make it as one of my goals to trick or treat at the Halloween party. But uh, I did get some. Uh, and uh, how much did you get? Well, you know those little bags that they give you when you first walk in when they give yeah. you your bracelet? Yeah. Uh, we filled up two backpacks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you just stuffed those bags and bags and bags and just went to town. Yeah. Nice. I, I didn't get a chance to post any photos because I, was, I wanted to do two things when we went to Mickey's Halloween party. Last year when we went, I was so consumed with being there for the first time and trying to take pictures and trying to take video. And I was so excited that as much as I, I thought I was in the moment with the kids, I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. This year, I tried to do it a little more actively. And I think I got halfway there <laughs> <laughs> because I still wanted to get video and everything Unfortunately, they ended up canceling fireworks for us because oh, of some no. unforeseen circumstances. So we didn't Aww. get a chance to see the fireworks show. We did get a chance to see the Frightfully Fun Parade, mm -hmm. now featuring Vampirina. Yeah! Yay! Which, <laughs> which I will comment on shortly. Okay, good, because I, I have questions. So that's okay. good. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I had a chance to finally get a full video of the Cadaver Dance, Sweet. which was nice. one of my main goals. So that, if in case you guys haven't checked it out, that is on the YouTube channel now. Check it out. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I love the Dapper Dans and mm -hmm. just the fact that they do this, you know, Cadaver Dans show for the Halloween party. Uh, I think it's cool. There was a lot of walking around. I'm happy that I was able to get it. I only bumped into people three or four times. And that's because they were also <laughs> trying to do the same thing and we kind of ran into each other. Uh, but, I mean, the video, I think, looks fairly okay. But anyway, your question about Vampirina. Okay. I was – so as I went into the party, I was kind of on the lookout for new things that maybe had been added, right? Um, and throughout the night, I wasn't really noticing anything. I noticed a couple things that were missing. Um, one thing I remember that's missing is the um, – you remember that scarecrow that they had at like outside of the Golden yeah. Horseshoe area? Yeah. Who yeah. would kind of sit up there and like heckle the crowd or like scare the crowd or joke with the crowd, whatever. Mm -hmm. That wasn't there at all on the night that I went. Was it there when you were there? It was not. Yeah. So that Aww. was that was missing. And I was kind of disappointed by that. 
Um, there was one other thing, and I can't remember what it is. But so I, I watched the parade because I that's the, one of the parades that I will sit down and watch because it's so cool and creepy and awesome and short. <laughs> but at that final float where they have all the villains hanging off of it, you know, with Judge Frollo and uh, Hades and all the villains on the back of it, they had Vampirina. And I was oh, like, wait, interesting. what? Like, uh-huh. it's kind of stood out because she's like this super cutesy, little adorable character uh-huh. amidst all these kind of big baddies. And I guess uh, I haven't seen the show. She's a new character to me. I guess she's a new character to the world, but I didn't view her as a villain. And so to throw her in this villains parade, like my question is in her show, is she a villain or is she a good guy? She's not a villain. Right. So what the heck? I know. Trust me. I said the exact same thing. Yeah. I thought that was such a weird thing to throw. I get I get it that they need to plug her right now. But I think they could have found a different way to do that instead of throwing her into that parade. Mm-hmm. So question. Where mm-hmm. was Gaston? He was um, not there this time. Yeah, he wasn't there. So okay. that's where he would have been, I think, yeah. is on that final float with the rest of the leftover villains, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so she may have bumped Gaston, yeah. It's interesting to know that Vampirina's in the back because I remember before they redid the parade, I remember in the back they just threw Kermit, Miss Piggy, and... Stitch what? was on there. No, Stitch wasn't in the back. But I remember them two being in the back of that float. Of the villain's float? No, before it was the villain's float. So I wonder if they just what thought, oh, okay, before? let's just do that. Huh? Was, are you saying that that float that they're using was repurposed from a previous float? What from was the it? previous um, Halloween parade. That must have been years ago because as long as I've been going to the party, it's been this same uh, iteration of the parade. Huh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So, Hazen, were you surprised? We, we talked about this before in one of our meetings, but were you surprised that the, the Gravedigger crew was uh, using their shovels to create sparks on the newly bricked road? Yes. I kind of was, too, but I was glad they were because that's one of my favorite parts. I mean, I like it. I like the effect. We mm-hmm. actually saw the parade from uh, the front of It's a Small World this time. Oh, we wanted okay. a different vantage point. And the reason we did it was because we didn't want it to be so crowded for the fireworks show. And since we've never seen any fireworks show from It's a Small World, we figured this is the best one to do it for. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, it was canceled. And back there, the shovels didn't bother me so much. But I did get a chance to catch the second parade as it was coming back towards this small world. And I sat right in front of Tomorrowland on the side of the hub. And as I just saw them scratching up the floor, I was like, what are you doing? No. (laughs) And so in the back of my head, I was kind of freaking out, especially after all they've done, you know, to that street and how long it was closed and everything with all the new brickwork. But I guess... Uh, instant weathering, right? Yeah. Right. They're aging it. For... There you go. <laughs> and all them sparks just making it nice and toasty. I actually, <laughs> I wonder how much it actually marks up the road. Like, I, I, I think I want to go back during daylight hours and really look at the road and see if they're actually making marks in it. Because I don't know that they really are. Well, I know that when here, if I'm doing yard work... And you know how sometimes grass grows in between cement blocks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so usually I'll get a shovel and I'll scrape it up in between to, like, get it to come up, right? And then I'll spray it with some, like, weed killer or something. Mm -hmm. And I usually scuff up the cement. Yeah. So I know that it has to be doing some kind of damage. Maybe, yeah. I wonder, though, if these might be, like, softer prop shovels that are made to know. create they look sparks like shovels to me yeah they do i don't know <laughs> they got fireworks tucked in underneath <laughs> yeah <laughs> they push a button and they pop out of the bottom right <laughs> their timing is impeccable that's hilarious <laughs> but the whole vampirina thing uh super confused about that because she is not a villain right. i think the last couple of parades that disney has tried to insert another property into an existing parade I, I kind of call fail for both of them because 
I felt the same way about the Incredibles float in Paint the Night. It was just misplaced. And I get it. They want to put it as close to the end so that people don't see it and just walk away. That's probably the reason why V was at the end and not closer to the beginning of the parade, especially if that's what kids went to go see. Mm -hmm. But she was really better suited to be right behind the Frightfully Fun Parade sign at the very beginning because that was the most lively part. That's kind of where Mickey and Minnie are, the other dancers. And after that, it kind of turns into the grimmer version of the parade. So not well placed in my opinion. But if I could guess as to why, like I said, it's probably because they don't want people just seeing her and then walking away. They want Gavin to stay there and watch the whole 12-minute parade. (laughs) Maybe that's what it is. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. Well, um, you mentioned the fireworks, and I'm going to shock everybody by saying that I actually... Uh, watched the fireworks at the Mickey. <gasps> okay, I have questions. Yes. I have Halloween questions. Party. Uh, I watched it from right about the middle of Main Street. Um, nice. In that kind of, I think I was between like Market House and the Crystal Arcade, like that area. Um, okay. And I got to tell you, I enjoyed it. It was really, really good. I liked the um, projections along Main Street, the projections on the castle. Um, you know, they've got that Jack projection up kind of to the left of the Mm -hmm. castle and he, as he kind of narrates it and then towards the end, like Oogie Boogie breaks in and he tries to one up Jack. And so there's kind of like story and momentum to it. And the music was really good. I was, I was impressed, you know, I mean, I've, I've gone on record as, you know, being the guy who doesn't like to really take the time to, watch those nighttime spectaculars but you know on a night like that when you're paying extra and the difference in that night is those shows and you don't get to see those every day i I think it's worth it so if you're out there and you're like me and you don't really care for the parades or the fireworks and you're going to the halloween party i would say definitely try and see one or both uh, of the parade and the fireworks because they both really add to the you know the feel that this is a unique party event that's different than every other night at Disneyland. So I thought it was cool. And I didn't know that are, were they doing projections on small world as well? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know they were doing that. I might've, yeah, I guess since they only do that once a night, you can't really see it both ways unless you have multiple tickets, but yeah, I saw it from main street and it was, it was really cool. They do this thing at one point with the projections on Main Street where they kind of project the buildings and then they like flip them. It's mm-hmm. like a weird effect where you're like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Because it looks like Main Street's like coming apart. It's really cool. It catches you off guard, but it looks super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I dig it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you had a chance to see it. Yeah. It was awesome. Okay. So I got to know. Uh-huh. What would you think about Oogie's part? I mean, I I liked it. I thought it was really good. I don't remember a whole lot of specifics. Um, To me, like when I watch things like that, I I remember like big colors and feelings and, (laughs) you know, the fireworks. So the details feels. Yeah, the feels, the the details of it. I, you know, I don't remember a whole lot about the dialogue or the actual like story of it. But I remember liking it. I was like, ooh, cool. Oogie's here. And he's like trying to one up Jack. That's kind of cool. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I liked it. The only thing that I thought was a little, eh, and, and I'm this way about all of the firework shows really is, you know, on the, on Tinkerbell's high wire, they do zero yeah, and zero looks really cool, but he kind of flies around in a janky way. He kind of just like, there was a lot of like stop and start. Like it wasn't really smooth and it might've been just who was operating it that night. I don't know, but I mean, it, it looks neat. It looked neater when he was standing still than when they were trying to fly him back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, yeah, it was, it was pretty dope. They may have had problems with it because last year when we saw it, he was super smooth. Oh, really? It just, yeah, there was a little dip to the way that he was flying. And so oh, it almost cool. looked like a fish going through the water. Yeah. Nice. It just, it looked amazing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I, they may have just had a problem with it the night that you saw it. Yeah. And I understand. That's a pretty massive thing to operate, I would think. Yeah. yeah. He's huge. By any chance, did you go to New Orleans Square 
and see like the meet and greet with Jack and Sally or anything like that? I looked in on it real quick, but I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time. I mean, it's it was it different than it is on regular days? So the difference this year was that Daisy was out there. The oh, tightrope walker girl. Oh, okay. And when I went back there, nobody was there doing the meet and greet. Wow. And really, I wanted a picture with Daisy. We're very much like you. We kind of don't stop for meet and greets unless our kids say, hey, can we stop for this meet and greet? Mm -hmm. And we did do one with Chip and Dale. And uh, the line took us like 20 some minutes. Wow. And after that, we just decided, forget about the meet and greets. Let's just go get more candy. Heck yeah. So we didn't do many after, but I was interested in at least getting a picture of Daisy. And there was nobody there. So I was a little disappointed in that. But I did see some people posting that on Instagram, and I thought that was a cool addition. Wow. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. did you guys pick up your free AP gifts while you were there? We did. Uh, we got the button, uh, and we got cool. the little print. Yeah, I did too. I thought what, they were really cool. What did you think? Um, who did them? Do you know? I was it Jeff Grenier? I do Grenier? not know. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him, but it, to me it doesn't really look like his style. And it wasn't credited on the actual gift itself. And honestly, I never went back and looked it up to see if it was announced. Yeah, it's so weird because they do a really good job of crediting the artists whenever they put out stuff like this. Yeah. And it just, I was baffled that even the CMs didn't know who it was. So I wonder, sometimes they have like marketing materials and stuff like that that's just, you know, created by a you know, a staff artist or whatever, like, like the maps, like they don't credit the artists who do the, you know, the little souvenir maps. Right. So, I mean, I wonder if it was just like a, you know, kind of a quick staff artist job and maybe it was a bunch of people that collaborated on it and it was just presented as by Disney, you know, cause they do maybe. do stuff like that sometimes if it's not just commissioned by one artist. Yeah. But I don't know. It's cool. It's got all the the traditional Disney Halloween colors, you know, the purples and greens and oranges, which I think is a really fun, festive kind of Halloween combo. And yeah, I, I thought it was neat. I, I liked how they had kind of a separate AP area in the old um, Starcade uh, yeah. spot. And so it kind of felt like a little exclusive, you know, a little kind of like a little private club, like you had to show your annual pass to get in there and they had um exclusive merchandise too did you get any of that no i actually didn't even get a chance to get this in person lynette got it for oh, me Oh, okay but the starcade has been used for ap stuff before when they did the ap event or the ap days uh -huh. that's where they held it they had oh, okay. like the props with the main street electrical parade and all that stuff that you could take pictures with they had uh, other Disney friends that aren't commonly in the park posing on the back portion of it so that you could stand in line and get photos there along with the exclusive merchandise. So I didn't get a chance to see much of that because while I was photographing the second parade, I believe, if I remember correctly, that's when Lynette went to mm -hmm. the AP area to get us the buttons and to get us the prints. Cool. So, yeah. I mean, it was fun. The whole the whole evening was super fun. There was a lot of walking. There was a lot of <laughs> pounds on our back being mm -hmm. carried. And we got <laughs> back home and we emptied out two full backpacks. That's I didn't get, crazy. like I said, I didn't get a chance to, or as I started saying earlier, I didn't get a chance to post much to the Instagram account because one, I had my phone in airplane mode because since I was trying to record stuff, I've learned that if I don't put it in airplane mode, my videos come out with alert sounds. Oh, <laughs> so nice. I have to shut off my phone and basically put it in airplane mode so it doesn't screw up my video or I right. don't get a phone call and it, you know, pr stops me from recording yeah. or anything. That's so true. for the most of the evening, it was like that. And plus, it helps conserve battery while I'm in the park. Right. And uh, aside from that, I was trying to trick or treat and enjoy, you know, collecting candy and walking around and stuff like that. So ultimately, super fun. Right before we left, uh, I could barely move. And so I sat down and uh, Lynette and the boys ended up writing star tours. And they were super psyched because they ended up finally getting a different scene than the same ones that they've been <laughs> really? seeing all the time. 
they got one, I guess, where they go underwater or something yeah. like that. Oh, oh Naboo. my gosh. That's exciting because that, yeah, it's been like the better part of a year since they've actually rotated the scenes. Yeah. You know, yeah. Ever since they added that last scene from um, The Last Jedi, it's been the same three scenes every single time. Yeah. And. Yeah. It's been really disappointing because that is one of my favorite attractions and I've stopped going on it because the thrill of the randomness has been totally taken away. So that's exciting to hear. Yeah. Next cool. time you go, now you have to make it a point to jump on. Heck yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I, I haven't yet talked about my very favorite thing about the Halloween party. The greatest thing about it is the line levels, the queue levels on the attractions oh my gosh so Mm -hmm. when i got there so i had been there all day like i i got there in the morning and i was just having a whole disney day and it was amazing but when i you know as we approached the the party time you know the the fast passes for the regular day start to get used up and then once you um enter the park with your party ticket then Mm -hmm. you know traditionally you could start getting fast passes with your ticket but I started having trouble with it. And so about a half an hour into it, I talked to a cast member and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble getting Max Pass with my party ticket. You know, is there an issue with the system? And he just said, oh, you won't need that tonight. We turned off Fast Pass for the night. And I was like, really? And because I feel like in the past they've still used the Fast Pass system. Well, this year they didn't when I went and they turned it off. And at first I was hesitant. But then as I walked ride on to ride after ride after ride, I just I had the time of my life just, you know, going on as many rides as I wanted to go on. Mm -hmm. And that to me is one of the coolest things about having these ticketed events is you do kind of have uh, an experience with less crowds, with less wait times, and you can really pack in a lot of experience. One of my favorite Disney moments ever was when I went to the party in 2013 and I I had this experience on Splash Mountain where I walked in, there's nobody there, they gave me my own log and they <laughs> let me just stay on that log for three or four circuits and wow. I just kept riding and on the last one I got this amazing picture of just me on a log by myself <laughs> and I've been hoping for that to happen again and it finally happened again this time. I walked into there to the uh, Splash Mountain. They gave me my own log. They only let me go through twice this time because people then started to queue up behind me. But I got another picture, you know, five years later of me on a log all by myself, just having a blast <laughs> at Mickey's Halloween party. So I'll try and uh, I'll post that picture so everybody can see it. But yeah. that that's so cool, like. So many people are occupied with the trick or treating and with the, you know, the unique events that are happening during the party that the ride lines are just wide freaking open. It's Mm -hmm. magical. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) It was the same for us. The only line that was super long was Haunted Mansion. Yeah, Haunted Mansion was still pretty long. And, of course, um, the cursed Peter Pan will never be a short line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, it's, that, those were the only two that were an hour long for us. Right. The only time Peter Pan is a short line is when the park is closed. That's it. That's true. That's yeah. That's it. Otherwise, from rope drop till close, it is at least 45 minutes long. I've said it before. Like, just don't try. Like, if you want, if you ever want to ruin the magic of Disneyland – Run to Peter Pan at Rope Drop, and you will see animals <laughs> fighting. Stampede! It's it's, Seriously. it's a nasty scene, and I don't like it. I like I avoid people it. go savage. Yes, right at Rope yes. Drop. Yes, it it's, is. Yeah, it's not it's not right. So I avoid it because I like Fantasyland, and it's supposed to be a fun, magical place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you guys haven't gone, uh, I recommend it. it it's I think it's all sold out for this year, but you know, start saving up for next year. It is such a fun event. You know, the they relight the park, they bring in fog all over the park, they have effects yes. in areas the rivers. The, like on the rivers and, and in the, the trail behind Thunder Mountain, there's some cool creepy stuff. 
They have a, a soundtrack that is different than you'll ever hear outside of that party. Lots of Halloween Disney stuff. So, you know, it's it's awesome. And, you know, it is expensive, but you get a good five, six hours of pretty exclusive Disney time uh, when you go. So I hugely recommend it. And, you know, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. And just to touch on what you said about how much it costs – you know, we we had to get four tickets and mm-hmm. four tickets, you know, versus the one ticket that you purchase right. does get super pricey. So Heck if you're yeah. taking a family, uh, it can really dig into your pocket. But like you said, the quality time that you get in the park for that handful of hours, I've never fully understood why people go to these events. Because to me, they're always like, ah, oh, they're trying to get more money out of the annual pass holders. And when we went to the party this time, the fact that the attractions were walk on and the fact that we walked around and saw so many things and it wasn't elbow to elbow everywhere that we went, it's not a way that you're used to seeing the park anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, we're so used mm-hmm. to seeing the park replete with people that it, it was just a, an amazing experience being able to feel like you could breathe walking around yeah. on Main Street. Totally. So, I have to second that. I would totally recommend doing this one. And if they end up doing any of those other Disney After Dark events, if they're anything like this, I would recommend going to those as well because they always have these special things that add a little bit extra value to it. So, yeah, totally recommend it as well. Uh, So anyway, since you mentioned Fantasyland, I wanted to kind of transition over to this video that's been kind of going viral. It's a... A gentleman recreated Fantasyland inside of his basement. <laughs> this That's is a awesome. thing somebody yeah, did. It's pretty <laughs> nuts. <laughs> when you guys first saw that come up, what were your first impressions? I want to know who made them. Like, the skills is yeah. crazy good. Yeah, it, it's professional level. I agree. I, I had the same first impression. Like, wow, that is yeah. quality workmanship. And, you know, like my first thought is they must have a job or a career in the field of like prop making or set design, stagecraft, something, you know, maybe they're a former Imagineer. I have no idea. Like they, they've certainly got a high level of skills or at least a lot of friends who <laughs> help them out with a, like, I don't know. But yeah, it looks legit on like the texture and like actual surface level. Yeah. It's it's kind of disconcerting though because it is just in his basement, so it's just standard like basement ceiling height. And so it's yeah. like it's like <laughs> fantasy land but chopped off at the waist, you know? It's like yeah. it's just the the like door frames and a little above the door frames of all the facades. And so it's kind of weird, like, it's almost like you're looking at a panorama of just the the first story, you know, and you can't see the second story. So it's kind of disconcerting, but yeah, it's, man, the it's so detailed and intricate. I got, it, it's really impressive. I, the only thing I'm curious about is I wonder if this person cosplays or dresses up because I would take advantage of that background <laughs> and just... Have a ball. Dress like a cast you know? member. He he huh? did create a, a million of his own selfie walls, basically. <laughs> he did. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> true. That, exactly. I, I'm going to comment on both of, of, of your comments right now. And I will break it to you, Melissa. It doesn't look like he cosplays. And oh. <laughs> as far as who created it, the gentleman that created it, his name is Travis Larson. And he's not a former Imagineer or it doesn't seem like he has any previous experience creating this. But he is a locomotive engineer from Utah. And so uh, approximately in 2007, he set out to create this amazing replica of Fantasyland. And it is, I believe, a 77% uh, scaled version of it in order for it to fit nice. within the confines of it. So wherever uh, he basically took everything and squashed it down 77% just so that it fits. Right. So everything is to scale, just squashed. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as the detail that he put into it, all the rocks are are there like you guys were talking about. But more importantly, he has details in there that aren't necessarily details put there by Imagineers. They're they're more weather-created details. For instance, uh, I think it's Snow White's uh, Scary Adventures that has a working uh, water pipe just uh, for condensation and for rain and stuff like that. And if you go up to the attraction, it has watermarks inside of that pipe that's coming out of the side of the attraction. He mm-hmm. painted all those watermarks and just the the fact that it looks like water was coming out of it. And it's those little details that just makes this one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. Uh, down to the details of how you open doors and how the doorknobs have slowly begun to wear away at the wood behind it. He carved Mm -hmm. all of that into it. So it's filled with these intricacies that if somebody that just wanted a replica in their basement would have started creating this, I don't think they would have put this much into it. They would have just done the basics. But this whole project has been over 11 years of on and off construction and i think he only took one year off because uh i think the recession kind of set him back financially a little bit but it's over a decade of work to reconstruct this and his daughter lives in a room downstairs like what her, yeah like her <laughs> room i would be too i don't remember if it's peter pan um, i'm sorry um pinocchio or snow white that she can look out Uh, into that little fantasy area but i believe that the entrance doors to mr toad's wild ride are his office wow yeah that's fantastic i know (laughs) he's got he's got sounds piping through he's got Mm. not only sounds of fantasy land the music from the attractions he has crowd sounds so that yeah. as you're walking through, it sounds like the crowds are just walking around you. He has a night mode so that he can turn off the main lights and it's lit up the way that it would be at night. It's just, uh, seriously, if he if he never aspired to be an Imagineer, he should. And right. Disney yeah. should hire him because well, so this is a great way to tell a story. Absolutely. So it sounds like he's just a hobbyist who yeah. just did this out of love. So. At like as a hobbyist, he's like wizard level, like yeah. top level hobbyist, because this is legit stuff. You know, it's With weird dedication. because yeah, absolutely, the dedication to put in over a decade's work that's incredible. I mean, I think a lot of us like the impetus would be if we wanted Fantasyland, let's just say, it would be like to create a a scale model, you know, like something where we could like look down on it and stand back and like view it all at once. But the idea to create something that's big enough that you can walk into and like experience like that, that is next level, man. Yeah. Incredible. Really cool. Yeah. He has his own YouTube channel where he's going to talk about all of the materials that he used. Like he picked up a lot of this stuff at home Depot and he learned certain skills in order to replicate certain pieces of the park. For instance, I think he learned how to forge special glass and how to forge like the iron works around specific glass pieces or something just mm-hmm. to get the designs that he wanted. So awesome. he works with copper. He works with metal. He works with all sorts of things. He, I mean, it's just... I'm speechless. So the one thing that I'm curious about that I didn't see any indication of is how much money he invested in this. Did you see a number? I did. I may have just overlooked it, but I didn't see a number, right? I don't so think what he's is, talked about What is it. your guess? How much would you guess he invested in this? Well, I mean, it really depends on how tactical he is with the stuff that he's purchased. Because yeah. I heard him say... He's never had to redo any of this work. And I think I heard him say that specifically on Adam the Woo's video when he walked through it. And to go 11 years without ever having to redo a piece of this masterpiece, that's phenomenal. You know, so that means that he goes down to the T and just goes over and over and over 
just to make sure that he's not going to have to do it over again. So I'm thinking that there's probably a good 50 to 100K invested in this already. Yeah, I'd say. Easily. That's easily. I agree. Have you guys ever heard of Amazing Interiors? Yes. On Netflix? Yes. Uh-huh. He so needs good. to be on it. Oh. <laughs> yes, he should. We should yes. tweet that out. <laughs> I'm going to tweet that out. Do it. See, it. it <laughs> It reminded me also um, many years ago now, uh, there was uh, an apartment that a guy had in New York City that he redid the interior to be all interior sets from Star Trek uh, ships. Oh, my God. And, you know, so it was super science fiction. It was like everything was like light up panels and, you know, it looked like buttons and machinery and stuff like that. Um and I think it came into the news because, like, he ended up having to like dismantle it and sell it, and it was like, it was like this big deal because he had it was it was the same level, like total, like top level hobbyist, like masterpiece. Um, so I would, I would love to discover more people out there who are doing stuff like this because, I mean, they have the time and the resources to kind of live the dream. <laughs> like that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. Cool stuff. Yeah. So Travis Larson has a YouTube channel where he posted a couple of videos of his basement, which is how this whole thing caught traction. And he's talked about how he's going to be putting up videos about how he did it, the materials that he used, the process of planning the whole thing. So we're going to link to his YouTube channel and the video where he gives us a walkthrough of his basement. If you guys haven't had a chance to see it, head on over to pocketeers.com slash 225 to watch that video because it is one of the most insane things you will ever see. And I don't mean like insane like crazy. I mean like insane like super amazing insane yeah that's it i'm telling you dude i am just speechless over all the work and the detail that has gone into it and i mean if we ever get a chance to talk to him the invitation is open mr larson if you would like to join us on an episode of podcasters and talk about your basement we would love to have you on sir because this is a masterpiece right hashtag larson on podcasters that's right (laughs) Uh, So before we move away from the park and talk about a couple of other things that we wanted to talk about in this episode, uh, can we send a quick congratulations out to our brand new Disney ambassadors, Justin Rapp and Rafa Baron? Yeah. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) If you guys know, we're very fond of the Disneyland ambassadors. They are amazing Mm -hmm. people that just kind of preach the word of Disney. It's something that started way back in Walt's days with uh, Julie Ream. She was the very first Disney ambassador. And, I mean, it's it's such an honor, you know, to be Mm -hmm. a Disneyland ambassador because you represent the Disney company at events around the world at times. And so if you are chosen for any particular park, you kind of handle your own region unless they have something massive like D23 Expo or something where a lot of the ambassadors come in. Uh, I am super fond of the ambassadors because, I mean, they're just so helpful. I mean, I've told the story before um, about how one of the ambassadors, Megan, back when I had gone to D23 and I met X Atencio and I met Alice Davis, the kind of the TLDR about it is that I was kind of going through this rough stage with my photography and just kind of creatively and everything. And I remember bending down to talk to X and to Alice and X told me, you know, follow your heart, just, you know, kind of follow and do what you love and do what makes you happy. And it it seems a little cliche and it seems like something that everybody would tell you, you know, if follow your heart and you'll never work a day in your life type speech, you know, but at the time it was exactly what I needed to hear, you know, to kind of like re jump on the bandwagon and feel confident in what I was doing because this is a Disney legend that was telling me this and who knows, he may have told that to every single person in line. Right. I don't know that. But at the time, it was exactly what I needed to hear. And that moment was absolutely so special to me. And I didn't realize it, but Megan caught a photo of that. And that photo means so much to me 
that she was there to capture it, that nobody else, I was there with other people, not one of them stepped up to take a photograph. And Megan just kind of saw like, this is a special moment and took that photograph for me. So the Disney ambassadors themselves are very special to me, but that's also why Megan is so special to me. And like that photo is just one of those Disney moments that you can't plan something like that. Right. right. It's just one of those magical moments that just lives with you in your heart forever. So, Megan, thank you to all the Disneyland ambassadors that are out there. Thank you for the job that you guys do. And congratulations again, Justin and Rafa, because it, it looks like it's a crazy ride. And we're going to be on that ride with you guys. So we're looking forward to meeting you. Mm-hmm. And those guys get to serve for two years as the ambassador, right? Yes. That's cool. That that is such a an interesting and compelling program that they have. You know, I, I've I've come in contact with a couple of them as well, also at D twenty three, and they are the epitome of that kind of Disney magical service. And uh, yeah, it's 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 awesome that they have people that can be kind of like the flag bearers of their you know, unique brand, because Disney is a very unique brand. There's nothing quite like it in the world. So, yeah, double congrats. And it's not an easy process either. Oh, I'm sure. So they deserve all the recognition for their work. Yeah, super excited to meet them. So. Mm -hmm. So have you guys seen the newest attraction in Hong Kong? That's celebrating Halloween. Yes. The nightmare one? Yes. 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 I've watched watched some videos. Oh, my God. (laughs) I have a sudden urge to go to Hong Kong because I need to see this. Yeah. You guys haven't seen this. Think about, okay, so how we were talking about reimagining Haunted Mansion and we wanted to step into Halloween Town. Mm -hmm. You get to walk into this. I don't even want to say attraction. It's a world. You get to walk in their world. You get to see what's happening in Halloween Town. God, I want a ticket now so I could go. (laughs) (laughs) But it's amazing. And it's not just a walkthrough. You also have Sally, Jack, and Uggie. Yeah. We need this. (laughs) (laughs) If you guys haven't seen the video, we're going to have it. Over at podcateers.com slash 225. So it's really cool. You want to check that out. Okay, Gavin. So remember how you've always mentioned we need a nightmare attraction. We need a nightmare yes. attraction. Yes. I think this is it. <laughs> and they need to copy it and just bring it here. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting idea to be sure. And apparently they've done uh, walkthroughs during their Halloween events before uh, in mm-hmm. Hong Kong. And I find that to be a pretty unique concept because they don't do anything like that over here, at least not at the Disneyland Resort. They may have something comparable in Magic Kingdom, but I'm not aware. Not until Uh, they take one of our ideas. Right. Exactly. (laughs) So Imagineers, they're listening to us now and they're probably going to, you know, if we blue sky it here, they'll (laughs) they'll yank something, surely. But I got to I got to be totally honest. It, it, mm-hmm. I when I heard that this thing was a thing, I forget which one of us found it and kind of presented it to the group and we all started looking at the videos. My thought that ran through my head is that we were going to actually get to walk through the town and see like oh, all okay. the buildings in the town like from that that center area and just kind of kind of like um Hogsmeade in the world of Harry oh, Potter, okay. right? Like, that's what I envisioned. I was like, oh, we're going to actually get to walk to Halloween Town and see it. Instead, just so listeners kind of have an idea if they haven't seen the video, it's more like you walk into a building with interiors of certain scenes and certain characters from the film. And so on that level, I was a little disappointed. Like, I thought we were going to get to kind of explore Halloween Town because, you know, That's just what popped into my brain. Now, (laughs) taking that aside, the interiors that they created are really cool. And they do feel like they jump right out of the film. And I I think it's it's a cool concept, too, because it's almost like a part meet and greet, part walkthrough. Because the characters that you run into in these scenes, uh, there's a level of interaction involved, you know, so... 
for example, there's the scene with Sally and she's kind of mixing up her potion to put Dr. Finkelstein to sleep, right? And right. so at some point she asks somebody to grab, you know, some certain ingredient off the shelf and hand it to her, right? And so mm -hmm. that's that's pretty cool that you kind of get to be involved in it a little bit. Um, and then there's, you know, some effects and some projections and some magic that happens along the way. And I think all of that uh, plays really well. It's It seems to be a show almost, like a walkthrough yeah. show. I, I had concerns or questions about the capacity, like how much they can move people through this. Cause it seems like you stop and you watch a scene before you move on. And so I'm, I'm not sure how many, I didn't see any videos that indicated how many people are standing there. Um, the videos make it seem like it's a really intimate setting. That's really small, which yeah. would be awesome. But if you're in a room with a hundred people and you're, you know, 50 feet back from it, you know, it might lose some of that. So I, I don't, I don't know what that looks like, but from what I saw, it looks like the experience is really cool. I mean, they are still the, co they look just like the costumed characters that we see in the parks at the meet and greet here. And I'm on record as saying, I think Jack and Sally kind of look ridiculous as, you know, as humans in those characters. You know, I think they're prime examples of, you know, we should be using puppetry or, you know, some other version of, you know, meeting those characters. But, you know, all in all, I think this experience looks really cool and Nightmare fans definitely need to check it out. And yeah, I mean, if we didn't already want to go to all the international parks for a million reasons, this just adds, <laughs> yeah, you know, a million it, and yeah. one reasons. So <laughs> it, it's cool. It's really cool. You know, it's funny. I don't have as much of a problem with Sally as I do with Jack. Yeah. You know, I, even I, I'll admit that. In this, in the particular video I watched, I don't know if we all watched the same uh, videos, but she kind of seemed like she was doing a Disney princess thing mixed with Sally. Like she was doing a lot of little prim and proper little hand yeah. movements that Sally yeah. doesn't do. I, Sally I is that. really kind of just awkward and gangly. You know, she doesn't do Snow Whitey kind of hand poses and yeah. and she was in this video and i thought eh, maybe it's lost in translation because it's china i don't know Does but she uh, do that here in the at the meet and greet in new orleans square i mean i've never attended She's that meeting she yeah. is mm -hmm. yeah, yeah but it's not too obvious she I've was doing photos she was really good about doing the the kind of knock kneed legs yeah. and, and kind of her, her gait that is off kilter. She was good at that, but it was the upper yeah. body and like her face and her head. Like she was just a little too sweet and graceful. Oh, interesting. But other the guy that was doing Jack was really good, I thought. He was, you know, doing kind of a lot of Jack posing that was really accurate. And then, I mean, you... You can't really go wrong with Oogie Boogie. Like. Yeah, he's a big sack. So right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I agree I, with the 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 gestures that Jack was doing. My mm -hmm. biggest problem with Jack uh, in that form is that Jack's head is very round in the yeah, film, well, and this looks yeah. more like they really tried to replicate a skull, and he just looks like an alien. Yeah, I've he never does. understood. They do that here in the park as well. Like, I don't get why they can't give it that round head, you know, and I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it looks super awkward and just kind of horrible. Yeah, I mean, I I would rather have it be like Mickey's head, you know. Yep. It's a, it's just something that you don't see the human face at all. Yep. You just make it Jack's face, and yep. I don't know. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I I love the Oogie's room. Oogie's room is probably my favorite of that walkthrough. Mm -hmm. I it, it's interesting to me that you thought you were going to walk like into Hogsmeade, knowing that it was kind of a walkthrough. I think mm -hmm. I've been conditioned to hear walkthrough and think of like a scare room or like something that's contained within a building and you're just walking through yeah. rooms that's mm -hmm. true i think uh radiator springs might have spoiled me a little bit because you actually get to walk into that movie and so that may have been kind mm -hmm. of the precedent mm -hmm. that i was thinking about 
But I thought at least you'd kind of walk up to like the town center and you'd walk into one of those buildings and then see the interior scenes, right? Right. As opposed to this is really just kind of one of their big show buildings. You know, it kind of reminded me of like stage 17 or whatever, but, you know, different architecture where it was just kind of a big box that you walk into and and then the magic is all contained within. So, you know, that... That was just a a preconceived notion that I had. Uh, You know, once I, you know, divorced myself from that, then I could appreciate what it actually is. And, you know, it is pretty cool. So, yeah, if you're in Hong Kong, go check it out. Right on. So, you know how Halloween's coming up very, very quickly. Um, Did you guys know that the end of the month, I would say Halloween week, um, Hocus Pocus is coming back to AMC Theaters? Nice. That would be good. I've never seen it in the theater before. I haven't either. So this is like a really cool chance to do that. So we don't know what I don't know what the ticket uh, prices are, but we're going to go ahead and have it in the blog post, podcasters.com slash 225. I believe it's the, yeah, the starts the 26th through the 31st. But um, I'm excited to see this. Have either yeah, one it... of you seen it in the theaters before? I no. saw it when it was originally in the theater back in nice. 1993. I think it's interesting that both that and Nightmare Before Christmas are both celebrating their 25th anniversary this year because those are probably the top two Halloween movies in the entire Disney catalog. Are we are we yeah. all agreed on that? Like there's, uh, yeah. there's nothing that. that I mean, I would say like Sleepy Hot Ho- Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but that's kind of half a film. You know, would be kind of up there. But these are like the iconic Halloween pictures. And it's interesting that they came out the same year and they're both celebrating those milestones. I think it's kind of cool. So, I, you know, it's been a long, long time since I watched Hocus Pocus. I want to say probably 15 or more years. So I'm really interested in seeing it again. I don't know if I'll catch it on the big screen, but, you know, it has gained this kind of cult following over the last 10 or so years, I would say not like nightmare nightmare is insane with its fandom, but you know, <laughs> Hocus Pocus has made this comeback, you know, and they do the show, the Hocus Pocus show in Florida at their Mickey's yeah. not so scary Halloween party. And that, that has driven a lot of it. So it, yeah, I probably need to revisit that film and, and remember more about it, but I remember liking it. It is a staple now every Halloween to watch it for me because why wouldn't it be you know along with right. nightmare before christmas it's like you said it's iconic so why wouldn't i plus uh, the fandom is pretty intense uh i remember not too long ago maybe two or three weeks ago um i know you guys follow her too she's a really great artist her name is savannah rodriguez uh mm-hmm. on instagram mm-hmm. her her handle is art savannah she replicated the spell book from Hocus Pocus. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of the um, most amazing <laughs> crafts I've ever seen anybody produce. <laughs> yeah. It it looked like a movie prop. She's done that uh, project several times now. And really? when she did it the first time, I thought it was spot on and it has only gotten better every time. And this latest version is pristine. Like it, it does look like it came out of the movie. She's she's super talented. Yeah, she it, actually just released a tutorial for it. Yeah, really? that's true. Yeah. 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 So All right. Well, own. I will get the tutorial link and I'll put it in the blog post for the episode. Podcasters.com slash two two five, including a link to her Instagram. I'm pretty sure you guys are following her already because she's an amazing <laughs> artist. But if you're not follow her, she posts a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, yeah, good on her, man. This thing is just <laughs> uncanny. I'm telling you, it's movie prop worthy also yes. it's not a craft it's movie yeah. prop worthy interestingly enough too she's another utah artist so the utah connections in the house tonight interesting interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right guys uh we want to transition to a totally different topic we're going to take it back to the main mouse himself we want to talk a little bit about mickey and because his 90th anniversary is coming up We wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Mickey's birthday portraits. Uh, His birthday portraits kind of became a tradition way back in 1949 when there was a portrait created for a magazine article for his 21st birthday. And then for his 25th birthday in 1953, Walt 
created this internal contest for all of his artists and said, hey, look, we're going to do this official portrait. And that's kind of what kicked everything off. Uh, mm-hmm. Gavin, tell us a little bit about Mickey's portraits, the tradition, and you know where we stand with it today. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it, it kind of got started way back in the 40s when Mickey celebrated his 21st anniversary. And um, they kind of had a, a somewhat of an internal uh, competition. It was kind of unofficial. It was kind of just assigned to multiple people. And one person's portrait kind of stood out amongst the rest. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the artists just kind of did little watercolors and little kind of pencil sketches. Well, Disney legend John Hench decided to do a full finished oil painting uh, for this effort. And, you know, he just kind of put everybody else to shame. And a lot of those artists were like, oh, you cheated. You did oils. Uh, so he, he kind of through that effort became, um, the, the pick of the litter, so to speak, um, the anointed, uh, Mickey portrait artist for the next many, many decades. Um, if you guys don't know who John Hench is, he's one of the super Disney legends of all time. Just pull him up on Wikipedia, go through his highlights. He has created so much of the magic that you know and love that you won't even be able to believe that one guy did it. Uh, but anyway, uh, he became the official portrait artist of Mickey um, for most of the history of this tradition. Now, I always kind of had this idea that they did a Mickey portrait, an official Mickey portrait every single year. But I was wrong about that. They really only do it for the major anniversaries. So they did it for his 25th, for his 50th, for his 60th, his 70th, his 75th. And then after that, um, after John Hench had uh, passed away, um, Paul Felix took over and did the 80th. And then the newest version was done by Mark Henn uh, for the 90th. So it's it's really when he hits a milestone that they do this. Um, but really, John Hench created this whole concept. And in the latest issue of Disney 23 magazine that Disney that D23 gold members get, they had this great article that kind of breaks down the history and shows you all of the official portraits. And I find them very fascinating because they kind of show Mickey throughout the years in different eras, in different types of clothing, even that would be um, typical of that era. And you don't usually get to see Mickey in a lot of different clothing, right? You, you mm-hmm. pretty much see right. him in his standard getup. Unless it's like in the park and it's like for Halloween or something. Um, But it's also cool to see a real portrait style, you know, done in oil of Mickey Mouse. And some of the pieces that um, John Hench created are really spectacular. You can find images of them online. We'll have them posted in uh, the blog post for this episode. That's podcateers.com slash 225. Um, what do you guys think about these portraits? Which ones do you like and which ones do you not like so much? Yeah, one of the most interesting things that I thought of these portraits was that each one of them really celebrated milestones in the Disney company, whether it was Mm -hmm. the opening of the park in France, whether it was Hong Kong, whether it was Epcot. There were these major milestones that were attached to each one of them, and it was not just a celebration of Mickey, but really a celebration of look what we've done in the last 10 years. This is where we're going. Yeah. You know, so it it wasn't as much uh, a a celebration of Mickey itself, but of the company and what Walt's dream has evolved into over Mm -hmm. the last, you know, 50 years or 60 years now. The portrait that was done for his 25th birthday, it almost feels like, it's really the only painting where Mickey is closest to model. Yeah. You know, absolutely. all the other ones, he's, I don't want to say he's oddly shaped because it's pretty much Mickey Mouse, but there's more human characteristics in all of the other ones versus, you know, how strict uh, they are about how you draw Mickey Mouse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. And that, to me, that very first one for the 25th is the most painterly and the most, like, traditionally portrait style of them all. And 
Yeah, I think it's the best. I think the first one he did that was a, an official portrait is actually the best. Yeah. And, you know, it's also he's standing in more or less a replica of Walt's office at the studio. And mm-hmm. it has that that warm kind of lighting that we've always seen in those pictures. And it just feels like, you know, he's just hanging out in his office with his partner, Walt. You know, mm-hmm. it's got such a cool romantic feel to it i i yeah. absolutely love that one i totally agree and i couldn't remember which one I, was the one that i really liked the best it's the 25th one and yeah. pretty much it's because he's just to me that style of mickey is like my favorite one if you were to give me all the different eras i i love just how soft he looks and mm-hmm. Everything that you guys mentioned, his office, that's it. It's like, how do you top the rest of them, (laughs) you know, per se? Yeah. But, yes. The other one I really dig is the one that he did for the 60th anniversary. You know, and that one, they're kind of celebrating the expansion to Europe um, with Euro Disney or Disneyland Paris. Uh, But in the background of that one, you see a bunch of smaller portraits of Mickey throughout the years. And, you know, it's got all the classic Mickeys, but it also has a little portrait of Minnie. And we've talked about it before, how Minnie kind of gets overshadowed because it's her anniversary, too. But, you know, Mickey's kind of the star here. Uh, But I like that Minnie was included in that one. I thought that was a really, really smart move. Yeah, I love that touch in that one. Can, how do you guys feel that apparently he's wearing glasses in almost all of these? Yeah, I think the idea is that they're indicating age because I, oh, I, it seems to yeah. me like he's dressing and um, aging as he goes on. So his, his clothing kind of depict an older Mickey. And then, yeah, the last two out of the last three, he's got what appear to me to be reading glasses, mm-hmm. you know, and many of us as we get older end up using reading glasses so yeah i think it's interesting because like you said most of them are off model technically yeah and you know for those to be official portraits it's really interesting because usually uh, disney artists are held to a very strict set of on model rules when depicting mickey you know with with few examples um that are exceptions so yeah that is interesting yeah did you notice Minnie's photo is not blocked or obstructed in any way. Yeah, it's the only one. Yeah, all of the others are obstructed in, to some degree, and hers is the only one that you can see totally. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. That, my, my overall opinion of John Hench's portraits are they're all pretty good. I feel like it's interesting, though, that from a painter's perspective, I feel like the very best one is the first one and the very worst one is the last one. I felt like they, they got a little less impressive yeah. by, by small degrees with each one that he did. And I'm not sure why it seems like less, um, less attention and time was spent as they went further, but maybe he got, was busier and busier because he became very involved in many different things in the company uh, throughout his career. Well, I mean, right before he left the Disney company, he was senior vice president of design for Imagineering. Mm -hmm. So you can only imagine what was on his plate at the time. But I think along the same token, the first one is very traditional to Walt and his style and what he wanted the park to represent. Mm -hmm. And by the time that you get to like the 70th and the, the 80th or the 75th rather, um, that's kind of when Michael Eisner was around. And right. at that time, it was more about the whimsy and showing not more of the tradition, but more of the whimsical side of Disney and trying to really expand. Like you said, that 75th portrait is possibly my least favorite of his series. Yeah. Um, it's To me, it just it, it looks like it was thrown together last minute. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's and very it's, flat. I don't, I don't mean that in, in a disrespectful way, but I know, like you said, he was very involved in many things, but it's the one that I feel has the least amount of character of all of mm-hmm. them. You know, I agree. In, in the first portrait, Mickey doesn't have really 
any props other than where he's standing and it just has yeah. so much it's so regal it it's it's very impressive like the the use of the tones in how we painted it it just it's it's very Walt you know you can see the connection yeah. to Walt Disney and what Mickey represented you know there there there's many comments uh that people say that Mickey Mouse is Walt Disney you know, mm-hmm. his demeanor, the way, you know, how he approaches life and everything, that really is Walt Disney. And that's what he was pushing through. And that's what you see in that first one. At least that's what I see. And yeah. by that last one, I don't see that anymore. I I just see a, a, a marketing technique. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I agree. Yeah, yeah I agree too. And so yeah. I totally agree. And then we get to the 80th one. And, mm-hmm. you know, no disrespect to Paul Felix, but the fact that he drew him at that angle is an angle we're not used to seeing Mickey in. Like, yeah. he drew him in this, uh, like, awkward, leaning forward three-quarter view where Mickey's smile looks really weird. And it it, it just it doesn't look I, – I mean, I know that he's smiling, but to me, it just – it it doesn't look right because I'm not yeah. used to seeing Mickey in that position, but I, I can, I know what he was going for. He was going for that worldwide connection that John Hench had already established in all of his mm-hmm. portraits, but it's a really awkward position that he put him in. So it's, it's a little scary, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was a return to um, some of his tradition as you know, I agree. And, you know, he, he included a globe, which, you know, three out of the five hench portraits included a globe. Uh, and in this one, Mickey's painting a smile on the world, yeah. which, you know, if you, it's not really a clear uh, concept. I don't think it, it, you know, it's not a real prominent smile. It's kind of a really, you know, relaxed curve that he's painting mm-hmm. on that. So I don't know. It, it, I like the colors, the warmth of it. It kind of is a return to that very first portrait. But I agree with you. The pose is kind of strange. And the concept is, I don't feel like it's its all there, really. Yeah. Uh, you know. And then, and then we come to the 90th, you know, the one that's celebrating all of the, the milestones that we're celebrating for Mickey this year. And I got to tell you guys, I am not impressed by it. I, yeah. I don't think that it is. <laughs> Sorry to mean to laugh. Up to snuff, compared to these other portraits, and as an homage and tribute to the mouse who started it all, I'm really surprised that this is what they ended up going with. And you know, no disrespect to Mark Hen, who is a master animator and a wonderful Disney artist, but this is not his forte. You know, I don't know that I've ever seen. Uh, a painting like this from him and it's an odd choice for them to pick him and i have i have so many problems with this portrait yeah like why are his underwear all the way up to his armpits exactly (laughs) his his pants are up like i mean i guess because he's 90 years old he's an old man (laughs) he wears his pants up really high i don't know uh but you know Many problems with the proportions, with the angles, with his hands. Uh, and then, you know, with the the idea of it, you know, him floating above the world on a bunch of balloons and then sprinkling pixie dust, which is a thing that Mickey doesn't really do onto the world. I, I don't know. I, I'm not <laughs> sure what what is going on here, but... To me, this one really falls flat. Okay, so I can't stop laughing. And it's because... Oh, and I hate this. Please, please don't hate me for this. But (laughs) I see the blue wall in DCA with the balloons. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. But we could turn this around and make it a challenge. How's that? Whoever's dressed as Mickey, recreate that photo. Oh, that's an idea. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. Just carry a handful of glitter into the park, and then when right. they snap the picture, just drop it. <laughs> it's every day for me. I could do this. Totally. <laughs> totally. So, yeah, I just I, – I find it very interesting because they're, they're making this huge push to celebrate Mickey this year. 
They're investing all kinds of, you know, capital into television shows and events, art shows, product, merchandising. And you would think that the official Mickey portrait would be a, a top priority. But it to me, it just seems like this could not have been much of a priority for them. Um, yeah. You know, I, I personally, as an artist, you know, hold Disney to a high standard because they set the bar for themselves very high. And that's one of the reasons I fell in love with the Disney company. And this, to me, falls below the bar. So, you know, again, I'm just I'm just surprised by it. I really am. <clears throat> I remember some time ago, probably a month or two ago, uh Disney D23 had posted a time lapse of yes. Mark Ken working on the portrait. And that was kind of my first look at what the portrait was going to look like. And I just I mean I I echo pretty much everything that you're saying, you know, exactly how you feel about it is how I felt about it too because when you think of some of the things that Mark Henn has worked on, I mean, his filmography goes all the way back to Mickey's Christmas Carol in the early 80s, I think. Yeah. And I mean, he's been part of hit after hit. Granted, there hasn't been a lot of Mickey in what he's done. I think he did uh, Mickey's Christmas Carol and he did, um, he worked on Get a Horse. He mm-hmm. worked on. Uh, I think it was only like two or three projects that he actually worked on where Mickey was involved. I don't remember all of them, but uh, I mean, he's worked on blockbuster hits like Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Pocahontas and Mulan. And I mean, you name it, you know, like if 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 it was a big Disney film and even some of those direct to VHS at the time films like Mark Henn was a part of it, you know. It, it's interesting that such an incredible artist who I totally respect um, created this particular piece. And this ends up being the official portrait for the next probably 10 years until the 100th anniversary. Yeah. Well, I mean, for the 100th anniversary, I mean, imagine the honor of getting the opportunity to be, you know, the centennial artist for for Mickey Mouse uh, I'm calling it now. The official artist for the 100th anniversary of Mickey Mouse is going to be Gavin Otteson. <laughs> there you go. You uh, heard it first here. I'm not, calling it now. So Gavin, get likely. started. <laughs> if we, if we, we should start a pool, like early predictions. Uh, uh, that's my prediction. I will have the longest odds. So if you put money on me, you'll probably be a millionaire. That's uh, right. Hey. <laughs> but yeah, I think it'd be interesting to kind of predict who might get it. Uh, between now and then but yeah i i agree it's it's such an honor and you know congratulations to mark hen for for getting the honor of of doing this and being a part of this tradition because it is a really cool tradition that i really appreciate that they do yeah well again like evan mentioned if you haven't seen the portraits we're going to put them in the blog post for the episode pocketeers.com slash 225 head on over check them out Join the conversation either in the blog post, Facebook, Instagram, or on Twitter. Give us your thoughts on which of the portraits you like the best and which you like the least. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it as well. If you guys are D23 members and had a chance to read through the article, let us know what you thought about the article. You know, it wasn't very long. It was just about a page or two, but it did have all the information and little blurbs on each of the portraits themselves and then a quick little write up on the history of it. So, yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode, guys. What do you guys think? I think so. Sounds you know? good. All right. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to let you guys know that this Friday, We will be launching, and that's if you are listening to this on launch day, which is October 10th, 2018. On October 12th, 2018, we will be auctioning off the Popcorn Cauldron for uh, City of Hope's Walk for Hope event. If you uh, don't live anywhere near the Disney parks and would like one of the popcorn buckets, which really looks like the apple from Snow White, uh, it does glow. It's a cool little glow on the top. Check over on our Instagram stories. You'll see photos of what we are auctioning off. Check the Instagram account. You'll see a photo of it there. 
Just want to send a quick shout out and thank you to our buddy Jason, part of the FGP squad. Uh, he has donated the bucket for us to auction off and he will also be throwing in one of the t-shirts that he has as part of the apparel line that he and his daughter have called Inspired on Main. So right inside on. of the bucket, nice. you're going to get one of their t-shirts as a thank you for your contribution towards our efforts to raise money to kill cancer because cancer yeah. sucks and cancer yeah. is a horrible thing and it takes people way too soon from us and we just need to put a stop to it. And the way that we're going to do that is by raising money and sending it over to the doctors and the researchers that are doing the good work to save people from this horrible disease. So if you want to help our efforts, head on over to Instagram. We're going to have that auction. And thank you to all of you that will be bidding and are considering bidding on it. Uh, head on over. We're going to have some other stuff. Gavin is auctioning off every single one of his Inktober drawings right now. So mm -hmm. if you haven't, follow Gavin at Gavin Audison Art. The link will be in the blog post for the episode. Make sure that you're following him and go bid on one of those Inktober drawings. All of the proceeds go towards this wonderful cause. We are going to kill cancer, guys. This is how we're going to yes, do it. Yes, we are. Team Boat yes, Willie. Yes, we are. Team Boat Willie. Team Boat yeah. Willie. <laughs> Uh, one one small correction. My my pieces will not be auctioned. They're simply for sale for fifteen dollars oh. each. Gotcha. Uh, so if you want one, hop on it. Uh, the link to my Etsy store is in my Instagram profile. Uh, yeah, and so all I'm I don't know if I'll get to do thirty one this year or not. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna do my best effort. But you know, if you see one you like, hop on it because in the past they have all sold. So, yeah. you know, yeah, help us out. A hundred percent of the proceeds of those sales minus any shipping costs are going to go towards this effort. So every penny basically that you're sending me is going to go right towards that um, City of Hope fund that we're raising for. And if you are local and you want the whole cost to go to that um that donation, uh, we can set up a time to do a local handoff, a local delivery, and you won't have to pay for that shipping. Um, so just let me know if you want to buy one and you're local. We can meet up at the park and we can hand it off that way or, or whatever you want to do. Uh, but yeah, let's kill cancer. Yes. And I was finally convinced by Gavin and Melissa that I should auction off some of my photos. So yes. I've been going through my archive <laughs> and I've narrowed it down to maybe three different photographs. Last year, when we tried to raise money for Walk for Hope, I auctioned off a photograph of the Hatbox Ghost that I had taken inside of the Haunted Mansion. Wow. Wasn't Haunted Mansion Holiday Hatbox Ghost, just regular Hatbox Ghost. And I, I remember that sold. I remember having a conversation with the gentleman that purchased it. Bill, part of the FGP squad, he was the one that purchased it. Quick shout out to Bill. What's up? And um, yeah, this year, I don't think I'm going to be auctioning off the Hatbox Ghost unless somebody specifically wants it. But I've chosen two or three photographs and I'm going to put them in my Instagram story, maybe in the Podcateer story. I'm going to let you guys decide which one you guys want to bid on. I couldn't decide. Nice. I'm going to let you guys decide. So help vote help determine which one will go up and if we get enough votes for it or we get super close maybe we'll auction off the other ones as well uh but right now the plan is to only print out one maybe two of them so help me determine which ones they are this week that information will be going up on our instagram account so make sure that you're following us if you want to follow any of us on our personal accounts you can head over to podcateers.com team you will see my links gavin's melissa's and aj and vj separate personal links as well so uh, head on over there check it out follow us if you guys want to follow us on any social network instagram twitter facebook just search for Podketeers, P O D K E T double E R S. Hashtag nailed it. <laughs> Beautiful. So make sure that you're following us. It's not Podketeers with an A, it's Podketeers, like mouse K tears. So that's how you can remember that. 
head on over again join the conversation follow us on youtube make sure that you hit that subscribe button youtube.com slash podcasters and youtube.com slash disney for two make sure you ring that little bell icon for notifications on whenever new videos are posted if you want to help us out a really great way to do that is by starting your journey at podcasters.com slash Amazon before your next Amazon purchase. Why? Because we have a really huge button there that you can press that will take you to Amazon. And all it's going to do is cost you a couple of extra clicks. But because of those (laughs) extra clicks, we get a small commission from Amazon as a thank you for mentioning them on the podcast. And then you going there, doing the clickety-clackety, clickety-clackety, and going to Amazon and buying something. Doesn't cost you anything extra except a few extra seconds of your time. And to all of you that are already doing that, thank you very much for that added support. Speaking of support, shout out goes out to the entire FGP squad for their help via Patreon. Wow, wow, if you wow. don't know what the FGP squad is, we call them our podcast fairy godparents, but they called themselves the FGP squad. Why? Because they're awesome. That's <laughs> why. Hashtag FGP squad. <laughs> If you want to help us out, head on over to podcasters.com slash FGP for more information about the FGP squad and a link to sign up. For as little as $1 a month, you can become part of the FGP squad. But for a contribution of at least $5, you will also get the exclusive Fairy Godparent button as a thank you for your support. More tiers are coming very, very soon. I know we've been talking about it, but we've been trying to really work that out. But it's coming, and I'm super excited about it. So keep an eye out for that. And that's it. I am winded. I need a drink. And it's time to end (laughs) this. Remember, (laughs) I was listening back to an episode where I was like, what's that? Let's light this candle. And we're like, well, let's blow out the candle. And every time we end the podcast, it just makes me think of what a spaz I am. (laughs) (laughs) We love your spazziness. Thanks, buddy. (laughs) All right, guys. So that is going to be it for this episode. Until next week, here is to beers, cheers, and Mickey ears. Have a fantastic week, everyone. Bye. To Infinity War and beyond. There's a Hulk in my boot. (laughs) 